December is our end, or is it the beginning of a story that teaches our reason for living? On this special day of holiday cheer, take a moment to remember why we've all gathered here. It's not about presents. It's not about trees. It's not about ribbons. It's not about wreaths. It's about the most precious gift that God gave us that night. The gift of His Son to make the world right. All right. What's up? Good morning. Merry Christmas. Can I say it yet? Yes? Yes? Is it time? Thanksgiving's it's after, over? It's after Thanksgiving. I can say it. Merry Christmas. We are starting our Home for Christmas series this morning. Is anybody excited about Christmas? As you can tell at Family Faith Church, we really love to celebrate Christmas, okay? But I think we have the right, okay? Because this the reason about Christmas is about our Savior being born, and God so loved the world that he sent his son. So I think we should celebrate it better than Santa Claus, better than the elves, better than the mall. I feel like we should celebrate Christmas, right? And the true reason of Christmas. So we, we do it all, okay? We celebrate it all. We do it all. We have so much fun because we're celebrating the birth of our Savior, amen? So, Mary, once again, Merry Christmas. Yes, we're super excited this morning because we're calling it Home for Christmas. And so, me and Rachel get to speak together today. Um, I'm very excited about that. Um, and we're going to kind of bring you guys in uh, to our home, kind of tell some stories of what it was like growing up, tell a little bit of insight, all the dirty detail. No, I'm just kidding. Uh-huh. <laughs> the dirty secrets. No, no, we're going to, we're just going to uh, use some of the wisdom uh, that we learned just from our parents growing up um, in some of these points that we had this morning. And we have a remix for you guys this morning. Okay. Worker, worker, Since the worker. girls are taking over uh, this morning, we, uh, you know, the story of the three wise men, everybody hears about the three wise men at Christmas, but this morning we're going to talk to you guys about the three wise women. Pastor of Christmas, Jeff should okay? never let me and Sarah take over the True. stage, okay? It's True. Girl Power Sunday. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Honestly, the principles that we're going to learn about these three wise men, women, are for every age, man, woman. We're going to talk about a teenager all the way up to a woman who is in the last days of her life. And it's for every age, every person. We can learn from the wisdom and principles of these women's lives to see how we can apply it to our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so just a couple of things before we get started, before we tell you who these women are, many of you probably know a couple of them, a couple of them. One of them went through loss and grief in their life. One of them um, had to face a major change and literally had to stand in the face of fear in her life. And the other women, woman went through disappointment. But can I tell you this morning that all these women saw God show up in the middle of their life, in the middle of disappointment, in the middle of loss and grief, in the middle, in the face of fear. They show God use them and show up in the middle of their situation. And I believe that this wisdom that we're going to take today is going to be something that we can use to make sure that God is being birthed and showing up in our world today. Amen. Amen. In our, in our job, in our schools, in our community, in our nation and in the world around us because can I tell you guys we might get a little passionate this morning because the days are too short and the world is too broken and we need the church has to be the church amen Amen. we have to be the city on the hill so we're gonna take these truths from these amazing wise women and this is this is a gender irrelevant okay this wisdom that they use is for every Christian everywhere and we're gonna take these uh, wisdom tools and we're gonna apply them Amen. This morning. Amen. And I think the first reason is why they were wise women. Why can we say that these were three wise women? Why can we say that? And I think the reason we can say that is because they were a part of the move of God that was happening in that time. God wanted to do something and do birth something in the earth. And for some reason, he chose these three women. Why? Why these three women? And if you read their life story, these women love God. They spent time with God. They dedicated their life to the house of God, to serving God's people. They were God chasers. And I think because of that, God used them to birth the move of God in that day 
three wise women. Why? Because they loved God. They loved God's house and they loved God's people. And so we're going to introduce you to our first wise woman. Are y'all ready? Yes? Are y'all ready to meet our first wise woman? We actually have a video we want to show you to introduce you to our first wise woman this morning. Well, you know spring chicken. That's the first thing my neighbor said to me when I told her I was pregnant. Can you believe that? Maybe she just didn't believe me, but I don't, I don't hold it against her. She'd been a tad bit cranky ever since she found that scorpion in her girdle drawer. <laughs> Maybe she just didn't realize what a miracle this was for me. I mean, Zachariah and I had been trying to have a child of our own our whole lives. By the time most of my hair had turned gray and Zacharias had turned loose, we had given up hope. But nothing is impossible for God. <laughs> he seems to delight in making life out of barren places. And as if that wasn't enough, the angel who brought us this unbelievable news had even more to say. This child, our son, would be used by God to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. This was all too much of a gift to be real. And then I thought, well, how am I going to train this child for a job like that? But God had those details covered too. And it keeps getting better. When I was about six months along, my cousin Mary came for a visit. And no sooner had she said hello than this unborn son jumped and flipped inside of me. Right then, God just opened my eyes so that I could clearly see that this young girl standing in my home was also with child. And he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. About nine months later, we got the news from Bethlehem. And I looked over at Zachariah holding our very own miracle baby. I had one of those God moments. <laughs> you know, when you just realize, you say, God just had different plans. He had brought us life in barren places. He hadn't forgotten about us, and he would never leave us alone again. Amen. Amen. So there we get a little hint of the story of Elizabeth. And what a powerful story of the faithfulness of God, man. God was faithful. Even when Elizabeth didn't think it was working out the way she wanted it on her timetable, God knew the whole picture. He had bigger plans, and he is always faithful. Amen. He's always faithful. But sometimes when we're in the season of waiting, for Elizabeth, she had faced disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. I mean, her only desire in her heart was to have a child. That was her only prayer to God was to have a child, and her answer had not yet been met. And I'm sure there was disappointment and there was let down. And if you know anything about that culture, I mean, that culture, that was kind of like a woman's job, you know, like they didn't work. They didn't do all that. Their job was to literally have kids and to bear kids and to raise their kids. And so when they, her and Zachariah got married, I know, and they had a lot of kids. Okay. A woman's job was to have kids and have a lot of them. Thank God I was not born in that day. And I was born in 2020. Okay. I only got a couple and I don't know if I can handle even them, but that was, that was their job. And so the one thing she was supposed to do for her husband, the job she was supposed to fulfill for her family, she was unable to fulfill it. There are one desire, her one job, and she couldn't even do that. I can't even imagine the disappointment and, and the inadequacy that she might've felt. But what we read in the scripture, Luke one, verse six, it tells us that her and Zachariah's life pleased God. 
which that lets me know they were God chasers. They were people who loved God and they served God. And to me, that's one of the highest compliments that you can get, right? Is that their life to please God. Years from now, the compliment I want people to say about me, yeah, Rachel might have been good at that and she might have done that and she might have raised some kids, but let me tell you, her life pleased God. That's the highest compliment. Years from now, I can say it for Mr. Gary right now. Years, you know, at the end of the we're going to say, hey, yeah, Mr. Gary's an amazing man, an amazing father and all that, but Mr. Gary's life pleased God. That is the highest compliment, amen, that we all want to have. And that's what Elizabeth had. That's what she had. And so I'm sure there was times where she was like, God, I've done it all right. I've prayed the prayers. I've, I've served in the temple. I've loved you. I've done it all right. Why haven't you answered my prayer? I, what, and the, the thing is, is Elizabeth had every temptation to let bitterness creep into her heart, to let her, you know, get bitterness in, bitterness at God, because God hadn't answered her prayer yet, bitterness at her husband because their family didn't work out the way they wanted, bitterness at the world. She had every temptation to let bitterness creep into her life. But she did, like my mom used to teach us when we were little, my mom would always tell us, don't be the victim, be the victor. Be the victor, not the victim. Because when things happen to you, we come home from school and be like, they talked about us and da 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 And we tell her our beautiful pity story about how they did us wrong at school. And we would want her to, you know, oh, poor baby Sarah. And our parents never really came to the rescue. No, they were, they, they didn't. They, they were horrible at They never talked it. to a teacher. They no. never talked to a parent. They never oh, talked to a, baby. A, even, even when it, we were done wrong. And even when it wasn't fair that Rachel could wear my clothes, but I couldn't wear her, go to her closet. You know, even when you're done wrong, she said, it was you always be, unfair you to be Sarah. the victor, not the victim. Even when you're done wrong. Even when, yeah, exactly. And so they taught us, you know, we'd come home and we, you know, instead of coming, yo, it's poor baby. They say, you know what, Rachel, in this moment, you have two choices. You can decide to be the victim or you can decide to be the victor and not let this run your life or affect your life and bring you that state. So we learned from little age, like Sarah said, she had a lot more talks of that than my mom than me, okay? Because everything was always unfair. Because I was the older Got sister, okay? <laughs> but I, I'm so thankful that she taught us that because now, obviously, in adult life, it gets a little bit harder, okay? We thought it was big deal as kids when little things happen. And I'm thankful that they taught me that because now in adult life, when it really matters, I can remember, hey, when they do me wrong, hey, when it doesn't like the way I want. Hey, when my prayers don't get answered when I want, guess what? I'm not the victim. I'm the victor. And so you know what Elizabeth did? Elizabeth got better. Instead of getting bitter, she got better because bitterness will kill the will of God in your life. If you let bitterness creep in and there's going to be opportunity for it too, there's going to be disappointments. There's going to be people that do you wrong, but bitterness will kill the will of God in your life. Look at Judas and look at Peter. They both were faced with disappointment. They both felt God, but one let bitterness creep into their heart. And if we look at uh, Luke 1 13, it says that what did Elizabeth do? How did she not let bitterness creep in? How did she stay faithful? How did she trust God? Luke 1 13 said she, her consistent prayers have been heard. Her consistent prayers have been heard. So what did she do? Number one, she continued in prayer. And I'm sure at first it was easy when she was 20 you know, because they got married young back then, okay? 20, yeah, God, I know, I know you have a kid for me. Yeah, I thank you. 30, God, you're still faithful. Yes, yes, 40. And I'm sure it got more hard, and it took more faith. 50, 60 rolls around, and she still hasn't seen her prayers answered. But the Bible says she continued to pray, and she continued to trust God. Even when the answer wasn't there, when she wanted, how did she want it? Did she get bitter? Did she give up? No, she continued her consistent prayers. Her continued prayers were heard to God. And then number two, she continued in peace. You see in her life that she continued, she let the peace of God rule her heart and her mind. And that's what we have to do. That's what keeps the bitterness out. When we let the peace of God rule our heart and our mind, you know what? I trust God. I know that God's on the throne like Amanda and Charles were saying. He's on the throne. He's working behind the scenes. He has a bigger plan than I could ever dream of. I'm about to birth the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He has a better plan, and I'm going to let peace rule my heart, my mind. I might have not, I got, might have gotten the report from the doctor that I didn't want, but guess what? I'm going to let peace rule my heart and my mind. I'm not going to let doubt set in or bitterness set in. What does she do? She continued in prayer and she continued in peace. Amen. And one other thing we learned from her, one more P. So the P's of Elizabeth, she continued in prayer, 
She continued in peace and she had patience. We know wisdom evokes patience. And this woman, Elizabeth, had true, undoubted, and obvious patience. Because as we read in verse, uh, let's just start with verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no children because uh, that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now well stricken in years so just like Rachel was saying that we see they are old and they are in most people's eyes unable to see the promise that they wanted to see the promise of God on their life but the thing with Elizabeth is she didn't give up she decided I'm not going to give up even when it looks dark even when it looks dim can I tell you parents no matter where your kids are at no matter if they've gone wayward don't give up keep in prayer keep in peace and have some patience have some patience because patience is so, so important. Even in a season of dis- disappointment, she didn't give up on God or his promise in her life. She stayed at the table. Amen. Like we've been talking about, Elizabeth was so good. And you see it in Elizabeth and in her husband's life. It says they, they were still blameless before God. And people could have said, oh, this happened to you because of this. And this happened because of this. No, these people were God-fearing people, blameless before God, and they still had issues, okay? They still problems come. In our life, can I just remind you that we're not promised to not have any problems. It's not always going to be daisies and roses. Things are going to face us. Grief is going to face you. Fear is going to face you. Hard times sometimes come, but we have God on our side. And if we can keep these three keys, the three Ps, prayer, continual prayer, patient peace and patience i believe that we're going to see god's promise come to flourishing because here's the thing about it is she still pleased god she still loved god and she was about to give birth to the forerunner of christ see delay is not always denial delay wasn't denial with her god said you know what or, i mean elizabeth said you know what i don't have a, a a baby yet that's what i want but i'm barren but that doesn't mean that i won't ever have it and what's so amazing to me When Mary walks on this scene, when Mary walks on the scene, it all makes sense now. Mary walks onto the scene, pregnant with Jesus, and now it all makes sense. Can I tell you this morning that she had to have patience and trust God's timing? You can't go down the path. She didn't go down the path. Why me every day? Why me? Why do I have to deal with this problem? No, she took her, 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 uh, her, self up picked herself up and went to the temple with her husband worshiped God didn't give up kept being persistent and then Mary walks on the scene and the moment she walks in the scene she understood the delay see because John had to be the forerunner of Christ that means that Jesus and John had to be born in the same generation And so while Elizabeth was in the midst of her delay and her friends were getting pregnant and now her friend, all her friends were grandmas and she's up pregnant and about to be a mom. They were, I mean, they were in age and grandmas. Her life looked totally different than everybody else around her. Her friends are starting businesses. Her friends are getting that mom car. Her friends are taking their kids to soccer and she can't do any of it. Can I tell you this morning that your story may look different than everybody else's story? Don't think that your story has to look the exact same way. You know, comparison is the greatest enemy to the purpose of God. Your unique purpose on your life. Because in a season where everybody else is getting married, you might not be getting married. In a season where everybody else is having kids, you might not be having kids. In a season where everybody else's life is working out right and people are doing all these things and making all this, making finances, you might have to just be staying at the table and saying, I'm just going to be consistent. And can I tell you with Elizabeth, her story looked different and it's okay. And it's, it, it really was God's plan that her story looked different. So don't compare. Don't compare your season to everybody else's season because your story is going to look different. Okay, so then, so then Mary walks onto the scene and she realizes that God, God literally wanted Elizabeth. He said, I want you to give birth to the greatest man. Matthew eleven eleven says, um, born of a woman, John is the greatest man that has walked the planet. Elizabeth, guess what? Yes, you might have had to have some delay in your life. And yes, it might look crazy, but I wanted you to give birth to something greater than you can ever imagine or ever dream of. So it's okay this season. Just stay at the table because there's something good on its way and it's better than you thought and better than you could have expected. So just stay patient. Patience. It's one of those things sometimes we don't always put at the forefront.
forefront, but it's so important in our lives. And I think, I think she even had to start yes. walking in alone, and we see that because obviously Zacharias was not at the same faith level she was because if you know the story, he, he ended up questioning God, and he ended up being mute. And when me and Sarah were praying, we're like, man, that would not be horrible to happen in our life, you know? We were mute. Can you just mute my husband for a day, Jesus? No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, we were laughing about that because we, we both have very vocal husbands, okay? But you know when people say, have very vocal husbands, okay? you know when people say, like, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all? This is like the next level of that. This is God saying, Zachariah, if you have doubt or you have negativity, I'm just going to make you mute. Yeah. And sometimes we have to be like, tell, tell people, say, hey, listen, you keep talking that way. You might just be like, Zachariah, God is going to mute you watch out. No, for I'm a little kidding. bit no, until the kidding. promise comes We're forth. Fun. But I think that Elizabeth got to a point where she had to walk this faith journey alone because obviously her husband didn't even believe with her anymore. And I think there was nights where she would just lay down and I think she would just pray to God, God, I know you're still faithful. I trust you. I know you're still good. I know you still want to give me the desires of my heart. And it came to a point where she had to walk this patience and this faith journey even alone. Amen. That's so true. And, and just like delay, delay and denial, there's a difference between no and not yet. And another good family lesson from my dad. Let me just throw this one out because I, as a kid, we heard it all the time. He says, if you can't handle a no, then you're not ready to handle a yes. Parents, that's really good for your kids. If they can't handle a no, they're not ready for it, yes. You at the grocery store and they want the candy and you tell them no and they throw a fit, they ain't ready for it, yes. Dad said it literally, he said there is no way you will ever get your way if you throw a fit. That was that was our life, okay? But there's a there's a big difference between between a no and a not yet, and a mature person knows a difference. When you're two years old and you hear not yet, hey, I want that my my daughter always asks, popsicle, popsicle. I want that popsicle, and I say, not yet, Brecklin. She thinks that means no, because she's immature. But when you get older, and we used to always go to Missouri, we used to take a road trip, sometimes two times a year, all the way to Missouri with all the family, and we were all hungry. Can we please stop? We got to use the restroom. We got to this. We got to that. And dad would say, not yet. We just knew that it was later on down the road. And so be really careful because there's a difference between delay and denial and no and not yet. Be so mature in God to know that maybe it's just a not yet season, okay? And staying at the table is so, so important. And so I just want to encourage you this morning that a wise person trusts God's timing. They learn patience, and they know delay is not denial. We see that in Elizabeth's life. We're going to talk about the second wise women. You ready to see the second wise women of Christmas? They are they're wise, okay? And this one is one of the most amazing people. She is the most, one of the most amazing person in the Christmas story, and even in the Bible. And we're gonna introduce you real quick to Mary. As long as I can remember, we'd been waiting for the Messiah to come for us. My family, our tribe, our whole nation. I always knew that he'd come, but... <laughs> Well, let's be honest, it's not like I'm from Jerusalem or someplace special. I'm just a girl from Nazareth. And everybody knows that not much good comes from Nazareth, never has. I thought for sure that Angel had come to the wrong house with his announcement. But if that's what God wanted, well, who was I to tell him he was wrong? And Joseph, well, God bless that wonderful man. He could have joined in with everybody else. He could have had me sent away. He could have even had me killed. But he just never broke the promise to marry me. And so when he had to go to Bethlehem for the census, I was honored to ride by his side even with heartburn and bloated cankles and nine months of pregnancy behind me. <laughs> you know those women who try different things to induce labor, like going on frequent walks or eating spicy foods? What they should do is go on a bumpy 70-mile trip to Bethlehem. Because not long after I got there, and I'd never done this myself, but even I knew it was time. <laughs> And with every wave of pain, I tried to ignore the fact that my family wouldn't be there to help me and that I'd be bringing this baby into the world without the familiarity of home. But 
when Jesus finally came, I forgot all of that, though. I just wrapped him in cloths and tried to make the most comfortable bed I could for him with the only thing I had, which was an animal's feeding trough. Joseph said I should have been sleeping then, but I couldn't stop staring at him. There he was. The one the angel had told me about. My heart was so full, I couldn't even find words big enough to express it. I know I'm not the first young mother to bring a child into this world. It's always been that way. But as I look down at my son, <laughs> my redeemer, I knew that he would change everything because he'd already changed me. So we see the life of Mary. What do we see blaringly loud in the life of this wise woman? What is so blaring that, that literally in that video, when you read the story, you just can tell, man, this, is, this is, evokes Mary's life. It's surrender. Mary was completely surrendered to God, no matter the cost. No matter the cost, she surrendered herself to God in his way. What was her response? When, when she was asked to take a step of faith that would take everything, it literally would take her identity of being a virgin and, and about to be married to Joseph. It might take her fiance. It might take her family away. It might even get her stoned and killed. What was Mary's response to that? To a huge life change that would flip life totally up on its head because God had asked her to do something, asked her to take a a step of faith what was Mary's response what was it it was surrender let's read in verse 38 Luke 1 verse 38 and Mary said behold the handmaiden of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word Mary's response to the biggest step of faith in her life that would possibly get her ridiculed killed would, would have people hate her we, we give up her dream. She was planning a wedding. And now she might not even have a fiance. It was, I'm your servant, God. You already know I'm your servant. I'm a handmaiden of the Lord. A handmaiden's a servant. Hey, God, you know what? I'm your servant, so it, don't ma it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm already um, d dead to myself, and I am, you're the master of my life. I want to go your way, so be it unto me according to your word. What does your word say, God? That's what I want. And in our lives, no matter what goes on in our lives, we have to be that way too, God. Whatever your word says, I'm going to do that. Unto your word, be it unto me according to your word. If it says that there's things that I need to give up in my life, there's sin that I need to give up in my life, according to your word, be that unto me because I'm a servant. I, I'm, it's, and being a servant takes selflessness. Sometimes it's, it's a hard road. But what I love about her response is that it was a huge response of faith. It was a yes of faith because it just welled up on the inside of her. And I remember a time in my life when my parents, um, they, they went up to visit my, my dad's dad, my grandpa in Missouri, and he wasn't doing very good. And this was the week before he ended up passing away. And, um, you know, we had Sunday service and they didn't, they were trying to make plans and figure it out. And they called me and said, Hey, Sarah, will you, you know, speak this Sunday? And it, I had never spoken on a Sunday morning to that point. And it was, it was a big step of faith. Okay. It was a big step of, step of faith. Just in, in that moment, you just think, you know what? It might work out. It might not. I might be ridiculed. I might not. It might be humiliated. I might not. But and there had been so much faith put inside of me as a young kid, as I see Brecklin and Eva right now, just faith after faith after faith. I saw my parents step out in faith. I saw my youth pastors would, would teach us about faith and all that could come out no matter, because this was a Wednesday before a Sunday, okay? And like the first time. So it's not like there was time to prepare, okay? 
the only thing that welled up inside of me was faith. And it was just, yes, yes, whatever y'all say, I'm going to do it. I'm a servant. And I, I mean, whatever it costs, you know, yes. And at this time I had a four month old that would not sleep at night and there was crazy stuff happening in my life. I missed sleep. We were sick. There was all kinds of stuff coming against and I, nothing was going to keep me from my step of faith. And I remember that morning, um, I had to, I was praying, Lord, I just pray they just show up. Just let somebody show up just to, just to, <laughs> just to do it instead of me. No, but, but my response of faith is all that God needed. He didn't need my talent. He didn't need accolade. He didn't need a big list of, well, this is the good stuff I'm good at. This is the stuff I have. All he needed was a yes. And in your life, sometimes all God needs is, hey, even if I have to sacrifice some things to make sure my kids are in the house of God or make sure that I'm reading my word every morning and I might have to sacrifice sleep, I might have to sacrifice some things at my job, I might have to, to, to have my kids around the right group of friends, I might have to move them to a different area. No matter what it is, when, when you feel the Holy Ghost unction you and God saying, I need you to do something and you know it's a step of faith, what needs to well up just like Mary is that yes. Mary was a, lived a life of surrender to God. Amen. And I, I, we were talking and I'm literally every year I, we, we do the Christmas story. I tell it to my kids. I read about it. I like to study the Christmas story every year. I'll read different books. And every year I'm so challenged by Mary. I mean, how can you not be? I, what I do is I look at her and I say, would I have done that? Would I have said, yeah, everybody can look at me bad. They can all think I'm horrible. My family can disown me. Everybody, I can look like, you know, the worst person in society. I, yeah, I'll give it all up for you, Jesus. And I think, would I do that? I mean, sometimes I won't even give up, like she said, a night of sleep, you know? Would I have done what Mary did? And I'm so challenged by that. And I love what the angel says. Because the first thing the angel says, he says, don't be afraid. And the second thing he says is, you've been favored by God. You have found favor with God. And I would know a lot of us, if an angel came and said, you know, hey, Lexi, you have found favor with God. I know my response would be like, thank you, Jesus, front row at Target tomorrow, okay? I got the favor of God, okay? Which I believe God wants to favor you with front rows at Target and all kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong. But in Mary's case, that wasn't the favor that she was about to see, okay? The favor of God in her life was about to mess up her life. All of her plans, all of her ideas, everything, like Sarah said, it was about to mess up her life. And sometimes when God puts and bursts a dream inside of you and brings favor on you, sometimes it messes up your plans a little bit. It happened in our family. My parents were youth pastors at um, Eastgate Church in Dayton with my grandparents, and they had just had this beautiful, gorgeous angel baby girl named Rachel. No, I'm just kidding. She wasn't as cute as the other baby named Sarah. uh (laughs) They had just had me. They had just gotten married. They were literally like 21 and 22, 23. They're in their early 20s, just now starting a life together. My grandpa's in Africa and he gets a word from God. The Huntsville campus, they'd have like a couple services at a hotel. And my grandpa gets a word from God and says, go home and tell Jeff, send him to Huntsville. Tell him he's starting the church in Huntsville and you're not helping him anymore. He can find a job. He can find whatever, whatever. So he goes home, sits my parents down and he tells them, you know, God told me that y'all are supposed to move to Huntsville, do Huntsville. We got this taken care of deuces see you later figure it out and it messed my and so my parents they their life was about to get messed up a little bit they were going to be torn from the the youth that they've been serving the church that they loved the people they were going to a place where they didn't have any friends they didn't know anybody and they were getting torn away from all that it messed my mom up so much that she said for an entire month she cried herself to sleep every single night for an entire month because she knew this dream that God had just put inside of them was about to twist some things up. Their kids might get home at 1 or 2 a.m. every night for the rest of their life and might be sleeping on floors. Who knows where? That's the story of our life, if you don't know. Growing up, they were building churches, and we were sleeping on the wood from the church that they were building. But they knew they wouldn't have the picture, maybe perfect life that they thought they were going to have in the moment. But look at the fruit of it today we're here today because they said they took a yes of faith to God and said yes Jesus it messes up our plans and it's not what we thought but we're going to take a yes of faith and they did that because they knew number two it was going to birth the supernatural in their life God is looking for a yes of faith to birth the supernatural in the world today when God did it back then he had a plan to take his spirit into a lost and broken world he did it through a teenager girl and we 
We've been, for the last couple of months, we've been praying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. God, we want to see revival in Huntsville. We want to see revival in our world. And you know what God's saying? God's saying, I already did. I sent you into your workplace. I sent you into your school. I sent you into your job. I sent you into Huntsville, Texas. My spirit is already inside of you. I'm waiting for out of you to flow rivers of living water to change the world around you. Revival's here. It's in you. Revival at Huntsville High School is here. It's in the young people. Revival at your workplace, it's here. It's inside of you. And God is waiting for you to have a yes of faith and birth the supernatural in your life. But first, it takes surrender. And I think, you know what? I think for Mary, the surrender didn't happen in the moment the angel came. The surrender happened years before. I'm sure at 12 years old, she would come to God in prayer and worship and say, God, I love you. I want to do your will, God. I want to live my life 13, 14, 15. I know the surrender for Sarah didn't happen when my parents called her on the phone. You know how I know? Because I spent nights with Sarah on our knees with worship playing, saying, God, we want to be used by you, God. We'll give it all up to do your will and to do your purpose for our life, Jesus. That's the cry of our heart. We cried those nights. And she, but yeah, the surrender happened. It takes the surrender, but it takes the yes, the yes of faith to birth the supernatural. She was already surrendered, Jesus, I know. But when my parents called it, it took the yes of faith. And it took me a little bit longer to say mine than it did Sarah. (laughs) It took me like a year later to get my yes of faith there. But I think that surrender is a lifestyle. It's a daily choice. When you're worshiping, when you're in prayer, you're saying, God, whatever you want. If you want to use me to change my workplace, whatever you want to do. And then it takes the yes of faith to say, yeah, I'll look foolish in front of the people that I know aren't Christians. Yeah, they might make fun of me and they might ridicule me and yeah, they might say this, but you know what? I'm going to take the yes of faith to birth the supernatural in our world today. Just like Mary did it then, we're going to birth the supernatural in 2020. Amen. We're going to see souls saved, lives changed, people won for the kingdom, people healed because you chose to be like Mary and give your yes of faith and birth the supernatural in our world today. Amen. Amen. And we are like super duper out of time. We're already supposed to left. We talk too much. I'm sorry. Um, But the last person was Anna. We were going to have help for our kids, but we're going to do that later. Thank you, Jesus. But the last person was Anna and we were going to read it, but we encourage you, you can go home and read the story. I encourage you to read the story, these stories, because you can be challenged by these people that God used in amazing ways. But the two things we can learn from Anna is Anna lived a life of worship and Anna's life was a witness. If you read her story, she lost her husband seven years into marriage. She married her husband. They were only married for seven years. She lost her husband. And so she, you know what she said? She said, I'm now going to dedicate my life to the house of God to worship and prayer. And the Bible says she was in the house of God day and night worshiping God. She dedicated her life to worship. And then when she saw Jesus, it says at the end that she went and told everyone of the goodness of God that the Savior was born. And so she dedicated her life to worship and dedicated her life to being a witness. And I know me and Sarah, we, um, we were like, how can we have a cute little Christmas sermon? You know, and we were trying to plan it. We wanted to tell y'all fun stories. But really, honestly, we, I mean, that's, there's so much at stake right now, y'all. There's, there's a broken world that needs the church of Jesus Christ like never before. And I wish we could sit up here and che- preach you a cute little Christmas story, but we have to charge and challenge you to be like Mary, be like Elizabeth, and birth the move of God in our world today. Be a part of the move of God. Be a part of what God is doing. Yeah, we want you to have fun family Christmas traditions, okay? Me and Drew, we are like all about the Christmas traditions. Yeah, we want you to party and have fun and open presents, but don't miss what God is really doing. Amen. Don't miss what God is doing. Do you want to say something and pray? Amen. Yes, I'll pray. Um, Just one more thing about Anna too, just like Rachel was just preaching about, preaching. Amen. Um, You can read it in Luke 2.36, but in Anna's worst um, time in her life, as a young bride, she loses the love of her life seven years into it. Um, in the, in the hardest time in her life, she chose not to go inward, but she chose to go upward because disappointment will try to cause you to go inward. It'll try to make you isolate yourself. Maybe your things don't look the way it should look right now, or things are, are a little bit difficult right now. It tries to call the enemy wants to isolate you, but you don't need to go inward at that moment. That's when you 
desperately need to go upward in worship. Let God do the work inside of you. Worship and prayer. Go upward to God. Amen. And I just want to encourage you this morning because some of you may be going through some things that are facing you in life. Don't go inward. Don't ponder on those things that are negative. Don't ponder on the disappointment. Don't ponder on what people are doing or what they've done to you. Go upward with it. Give it to God and say, I know that the only way I'm going to get through this with victory and not let this one season in my life be the rest of my life is to take it to God and give it to him. Amen. We're going to pray real quick. If you want to bow your heads and close your eyes, God, we thank you this morning that we will take these wisdom tools from the three wise women of Christmas, God, that they were so amazing and so wise. And we thank you, Father, that even in 2020, that we can be Christians that live a life of surrender, live a life of sacrifice, but God also have the peace and the patience and the prayer. And there's people in this building, Family Faith Church, are full of people of patience and prayer and full of people of surrender. And I thank you, God. We say this morning in this Christmas, do your will and have your way. We are your handmaidens. We are your servants, God. And we pray, God, in our lives, show us what you would want us to do, God. Show us the steps of faith that we need to take in our job tomorrow on a Monday morning, God, give us unctions and steps of faith that we can take, Lord, and to take this message and put it in to our world, God, to live your word in our lives according to your word, be it unto us in Jesus' name, amen and amen.